Welcome to Secrets from the Scene, a show for local musicians who want to improve their music, grow their audience, and learn about Minnesota's music scene. If you're interested in talking about all things music related and meeting interesting people from our local community, you're in the right place. Welcome to Secrets from the Scene. My name is Stephen Helvig and I'm your host. On today's episode, I have Landon Conrath and I'm so excited to have him here today and to pick his brain about the last five years. Landon's story is super interesting and I think just talking about his journey over the last four or five years is going to be enough in and of itself because you've come so far in such a short amount of time. I think that in a lot of ways, your progress through this, like through the musical scene or whatever, is what everybody would want because it kind of went bananas right away. Like song number one, things take off. Mm -hmm. You're seeing viral level success from, a, from an immediacy. But what does that do? How do you manage that? How do you grow with that? How do you keep up with expectations? I think there's so much we're going to learn today. And yeah. I'm excited to pick your brain. For anybody that doesn't already know Landon Conrath, he started in 2019, 2020, and is already up to having over half a million Spotify monthly listeners, which is an incredible feat. Touring all over the country, tours get bigger all the time, selling out clubs. There's going to be a lot here to unpack. So please welcome Landon Conrath. Heartstrings, Sundays out, cover my face with the top sheet. Burn it down. Won't you burn it down for me? Calls on a break. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me here. I'm so stoked. Hey, man, thanks for making time. Mm -hmm. I know that there's always a lot of things that are, are showing up in your inbox, I'm no, sure, that absolutely. you have to decide and make time for. So I, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Since I didn't, you know, read a typical bio here, Give people more than what I just did in terms sure. of those last four or five years, the highlights, where it started, yep. and walk people through that history. So yeah, I can give a quick version here. Yeah, like you said, I started kind of around um, pandemic time. I wrote my first song in like 2019. I grew up a drummer, and that's what I wanted to do. I never thought about songwriting or really singing for that matter. I had idols like Aaron Sterling and Paul Maybury, and I was a student of Steve Gould's um, when he was in town. And so that's what I wanted to do. And I had a friend in college who was really great at songwriting, and I always wondered how she did it, and I was super confused by the process. And so I finally just kind of tried to do one, and I had a friend in town who wanted to produce more. And yeah, so we met up, put the song out, no expectations. I kind of had a weird time with the process. It was hard for me to fork over creative liberties for the first time. Like he came in and changed the song a lot and it was uh, jarring at first, but put out the song and it did pretty well. And we were kind of confused by that. And so we just kind of kept going. And my second song, Acetone, um, got picked up by this playlist editor named Blake. And she put it on this playlist called Good Vibes. And it had a couple million followers or something. And from there, it just took off a bit. And so we kept putting out music. And yeah, that's just kind of been the story of the last four years. And we've always tried to keep that like DIY-ish spirit. I signed to Network Music Group in 2021, right when I was graduating college. And it's just been kind of a mix of touring and writing as fast as I can for the last four years. And we've put out almost like 40 songs now, which is insane. It is insane. I mean, the whole thing feels like a sprint. Yeah. And it has know? been for sure. Yeah. I have a couple questions about that past. So you started songwriting in 2019, but as a drummer mm -hmm. before that, presumably, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I've been around music for a long time. I grew up playing piano and all the things as okay. one does. And I played in church a lot. But yeah, drums was my thing. And that's the only instrument I've ever really like studied like deeply. Yeah. Like I was in jazz in college and that was like my whole thing. Like I loved that and I spent so many hours on it. So that's like the only instrument I'll tell people that I'm like good at. Like everything else is just I'm winging it. As you're on a full tour as a guitarist. Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> but drums is my thing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. When did guitar start being in the picture? Uh, just out of necessity, when I couldn't play drums in my dorm room in college, I brought 
a guitar that I had gotten for free from a friend because I wanted to play music of some kind. And so as any 19-year-old does, I learned a million John Mayer songs. <laughs> and that's how I learned guitar, just from like YouTube and listening to songs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would love to have a guitar lesson, but I never have. It'd be cool, though. Well, it's never too late. I guess so. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your guitarist could, you know, yeah, spare exactly. a few minutes yeah, on the road. Yeah, Caleb on it for sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. Like, give them a little outline. Here's, yeah. Here's the syllabus for the yep. semester's tour. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to learn something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You grew up with musicians in your family? Yeah, kind of. My grandparents on my mom's side were extremely musical, like choir directors and music teachers. Okay. And my mom was kind of a musician by proxy, but she is like, she taught math at a college in town for 30 years. Like, she's more that side of things but she was a cellist and things like that. So it's like yeah, yeah. music has been around me for my whole life, but like my sisters aren't really musical and my dad isn't. So I was kind of the only one in my family per se, but my family as a whole is very musical. Like singing is a big part of like our gatherings and things. It's kind of funny. Like we sing around the table and stuff. It's weird, but yeah. Well, I, I think that that explains a little bit of how easy it's been. And I guess maybe easy is not the right word sure. to say, but that you've picked up everything at a very high level. Sure. Fairly quickly. Yeah. You know, in terms of, yeah, I started playing guitar and then pretty quickly I'm a guitarist. Sure. And like, you know, I started writing songs and then immediately that was great. And, sure. you know, I think a lot of that can just be innate, mm -hmm. but having those influences around you. Oh, absolutely. You know, that gives people a head start versus like, I want to start to do this. No, and, absolutely. You know, that, yep. Church is a, always a breeding ground for that stuff yep. too. Where mm -hmm. just I know a weekly, you're always having some exposure to it. That story is familiar to yep. a lot of local musicians, especially. Okay, so you're studying drums. Then was that you were a music major? No, I was. I actually graduated with a computer science degree of all things. Oh, okay. That was just jazz was like an elective, I guess. It was a course that I took. I don't know if you're familiar with the director at Bethel. His name is Jason Harms. He's kind of been around the Minnesota jazz scene for a while. He's super great. I learned a ton from him. I just like specifically on he really emphasized like how to make the process enjoyable and how to like find pleasure in the work of it all. That was like his big thing. Say more about that. Yeah, his I mean, that was kind of his quote. He's like, how do you find pleasure in the work? And so like he really turned me on to like just really practical things like one of the best ways to get better at music is to listen to music. And he would say like, this is your work, like go take pleasure in it. Go like listen to like your homework tonight is to just listen to this album. You know, he'd send me like a, like Sinatra Live at the Sands is mm -hmm. like a super famous big band record. And it's like a prime example of just a band that's like swinging super hard. And it was just like, I don't know, that's where I learned how to kind of glean the right information from music and like how to take things that you hear and put them into your playing. And he was just good at like pointing out things that I was missing. Like when I first came in to playing jazz, I had been playing CCM church music, mostly on drums. And so I had like a really heavy right foot. And he right away explained like, here, listen to how Tony Williams and the Miles Quintet, listen to how he has such a light touch with that. And he was just good at like showing you how to take bits and pieces from other people's stuff and put it into your own playing. Mm -hmm. So he was just great at that. And he was great at explaining things. And so I don't know. Cool. I, I really enjoyed my time with him, but. And you finished your degree at Bethel? I did. Yeah. Yep. Yep. My mom worked there. I mm -hmm. never wanted to go to college when I was in high school. It wasn't on my mind. I went on tour, like I was mentioning with Harbin Home right out of high school. And I was like, I'm going to be a rock star. Like, screw this. I'm not going to college. And then after tour, you get dropped back at home and life is normal again. And you're like, well, what do I do? Twiddling my thumbs. And like I said, my mom worked there. So it was like cheaper tuition. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go and do my time. And. Yeah, music didn't really start till like my end of my junior year of college. And okay. then it kind of took over, but and I that's finished sort it. of when you started the songwriting thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, let's talk about that moment. Yep. You have some talented friends around you. Yep. One is showing you how to write songs, one is uh, offering production skills. You yep. know, again, perfect storm at mm -hmm. perfect time. But you also had to bring all that idea and energy and vulnerability to the process. From those first times when you're stumbling through a DAW and you're figuring stuff out up till now, how does that process look like for you and how has it changed over the years? Sure. Well, I like started producing, not really producing, but like I recorded drum covers a bunch when I was like in high school and honestly late middle school. I have to give massive credit to my parents for like basically starting my career because I mean, we were a family that like for Christmas and birthdays, it was like gifts were never above like 
thirty dollars, things like that. And for in eighth grade, they bought me a laptop, which was like insane, and I was like mind blown. And that was the first time I was able to start recording things because I bought like a the worst four channel interface I could find, and I scoured Facebook Marketplace, and I remember I bought three fifty sevens from a guy for like ninety dollars or something. Mm-hmm. And he gave me a handful of XLRs and I'll never forget. He's like, every musician needs some XLRs, buddy. Go record something. And I was like, cool. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like in eighth grade and I'm recording like Reliant K drum covers. So that yeah, was yeah. the first time that I learned that. And then in college, when I started adding songwriting in, it was always like, I feel like my songwriting was very vertical in the sense of in the DA, I was just making like huge stacks of things and focusing on a five, 10 second loop, and then just trying to write a whole song where it never changed. Yep. I feel like that's a thing that people, a trap people fall into with modern DAWs now. It's like you make your five, 10 second loop, and then you try and just write a whole song over it. And that was kind of my process for a while. And when I started writing songs with Alex, who was the producer that I made all my first EPs with, we kind of took that idea and ran with it where we were making the production first. Basically how it worked was I would write a loop, I'd write a guitar line or something. And then I bring it to him and we just kind of pick one of the best and then we'd write a song over it. And it kind of stayed that way for a long time where I was like finishing the song and then writing lyrics until now it's kind of become more of a thing where I'm doing it at the same time. But I don't know, I still feel like I tend to enjoy writing a production vibe first because it kind of sets the mood for me. Mm -hmm. I've never been like a I don't know if I want to call it a traditional songwriter, but like the person who just has like journals overflowing with songs and poems and things like that. Like I wish I was more like that, but I just have never really been that way. And I more am writing songs when there's a da in front of me and less like I'm sitting on the porch with a guitar. And I think there's merit, obviously, to the other side. And I want to be more like that, but it just isn't how it's worked for me. But I think everybody wants what they don't have. No, exactly. (laughs) Absolutely. The grass is a million times greener always on the other side in in this world. And you have to remind yourself of that constantly. But yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, because the the big pro side of this is that your songwriting process is tied to producing Mm -hmm. in in all the ways because you're doing it through a DAW a lot of times. Yep. And so your productions get better and better and better. And understanding there's so much to be gained from the process that you're doing it. Mm -hmm in a production sense sure because you you really start to well first you get proficient in a daw when you're Mm -hmm. using it all the time so that has its own advantages but then second you start to see how layers and the math and the structural things and things like that can work out and how ideas can come from random sounds and effects and oh absolutely you know there's just there's a whole other world that that has nothing to do with like song idea yep (laughs) <laughs> melody chord progression. I 100% agree that there's a lot of value to that too. Oh, absolutely. And there's a time and a place for that. At the same time, have you ever done it the other way around where like there's a friend of yours maybe? Well, actually here, let me back up. Sure. Two questions. Yep. First, have you acted solely as producer on projects? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a few times. I've done some like client work like that. Okay. It's been super fun. I really enjoy that. But yeah. It's not something I do often. Okay, so on the client work, yeah. have you ever started from where it was just guitar, vocal? And had else? to bring it somewhere? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's like an exciting but also scary thing because most of the time when people come in with a guitar and vocal and they're like, yeah, I don't really know what I want. Right. They do actually know what they want. They just don't know how to say it. And every time you try and give something, a lot of times it's like not right. And mm-hmm. so sometimes that can be tough to find what someone's looking for. But it's a good challenge. I... I really would like to do more production work like that, more client work. I feel like that's kind of like where I see my like life going. Yeah. Cause I don't wanna, I don't wanna tour for 40 years. You know, like I don't wanna do that. Like I'd love to be able to just kind of fall into something like that more. But it's like an exciting and scary thing when people just come with nothing and you're like, okay, what are we doing today? You know, but it can can be very difficult to figure out what those soundscapes and things are versus if you're writing over them. Yep you can marry it, I think, a little bit. To me, it's easier to marry it that way than it is to go the other way around. Unless you're very much in your niche. Yep. You came to me No, I make this kind of thing and I can keep making this kind of thing. That's when I like it. Yeah. (laughs) But if you're trying to figure out what their thing is, man, that's hard. Mm -hmm. I've done that plenty of times. And there's been projects where I've literally just been like, 
you should just get logic sure and make stuff yep and then i will come in and help we can elevate it elevate like, it yep. and fix it but like i can't make this from scratch for you perfectly in your vibe like it's just never gonna happen it's not true it probably could but it just wouldn't be time efficient at all yeah but okay yeah that's that's all super interesting the other question that i had was when i look through your songs and listen to your stuff you know i'm a producer so i'm always clicking on the credits yeah like looking yep. at stuff and oh i wanted to quickly circle back to when you were referencing alex yes alex kimball yep yes just so that people if they want to look him up they can Yep. He's in town? Please? No, he moved to LA two years ago. Okay. He's doing an artist thing right now and he's crushing it. And he goes by Levi Roth. Okay. So yeah, you should check him out. He's that's amazing. his artist thing is what you're yep. saying. Yep. Yeah. And that's like what he does all his productions under that name now too. It's kind of just Levi like- Roth. We'll tag him. Yeah. I'll look into it. I mean, I'm- Well, so I, I'm going through all the credits to get back to what I was saying. And you're collaborating a lot. Talk to me about that. Like, obviously we know how the first one started with Alex of like a friend wanted to do it. I'm a huge proponent of collaboration. I think it's great. I think it yields better results more oh, times than not. Yep. But walk me through how that's how that process has worked because you did openly say like right away it wasn't great. Yep. But you've continued on with it. Yep. So clearly it's something that you have come to enjoy yeah. or appreciate or respect. And value. Or what, yeah. Yep. But you've also worked with a lot of different people. So I guess there's two questions is how, how do your collaborations typically work? And then how mm -hmm. do you continue to find more and more collaborators? Sure. I feel like it starts with me signing to network and then that opened up the weird magical curtains of the music industry. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, people want me to go to LA and they want me to do stuff. And it's like, wow, this is so glamorous. And then you realize that it's actually just whatever. And you're sleeping on your friend's couch in Hollywood and it sucks actually kind of. But that's when I started to collaborate more was because the label was like pushing their producer friends on me. Got it. And my A&R set up a bunch of sessions and I, being the wide-eyed 21-year-old who just signed a record deal, was like super down to try everything. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I would go on these two week trips every few months to LA and I would meet someone new every single day. And it was like the speed dating session thing, which is really common there. And it, it's so tiring because you have to basically every single day you show up to the session, you like give them your life story and you talk about your life for like 45 minutes to an hour. And then you try and write a song and you try and have it done by the end of the session. And it's like, you're coming off of sleeping on a floor. You're not really eating healthy because you don't have like access to like a kitchen or groceries. And you're just like spending a million dollars to like eat food and transport yourself around the city. And it's just tiring and draining. But I met a lot of amazing people. But there were so many other things in that where the industry does a terrible job of communicating things like how does a producer agreement work? How does a contract work with like how much you're paying for this. No one talks about money in the beginning of a session because I can see both sides because a lot of times you make songs with people and they don't end up going anywhere. Mm -hmm. But when they do end up going anywhere, all of a sudden it's like this producer has your song in a little cage and they're like, all right, you owe me $4,000. And you're like, okay, well, I didn't know that when we started, but yeah. I want to put this song out. And so you have my song hostage. I remember right. there was a specific producer um, that I was working with. And I didn't know what his rate was as per usual. And my management back then was fine, but they did kind of a bad job at keeping me in the dark with that kind of stuff, even yeah. though they're spending my money. And yeah, so we finished the song and I was like, okay, like how do I get this guy paid out? And they're like, oh yeah, so his rate is 2,500 and then 500 for the mix. And then he actually has a studio charge date of 500 a day for his studio. And I didn't know that. And I had scheduled two extra days with him to go back and just like work on the song because I ha was having a lot of fun with him. And I was like, this is gonna be fun. Like, let's do two more days. Right. I didn't know that was gonna cost me a thousand dollars, you right. know? And it's, so it's like all of a sudden this song cost four grand or something. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, that's like a huge chunk of my advance for one song, you know? Right. It's this weird thing with collaborating where it's like when you don't know what people are like or what their rates are. And it's like this weird hidden thing where people don't tell you their rates until the very end. And it's like, yeah. here, my manager's going to hit you with the invoice. Okay, I guess I'll wait and see what it is, you know? So that's something that I've learned now. Just to ask up front kind of thing. Yeah, and or just working with people who I know, you know? Like I've started to do way less of the speed dating or like blind session thing. Yeah. I don't really do that anymore. I kind of have a group of people now. 
But when I was doing it back then, it was just like, yeah, I was just trying to meet people. My a r was just put me in sessions yep. and that was just what we did. But now I have a new manager who's really connected, has an amazing cohort of people. And we've kind of just found the people that gel the best, people who are what I think is like fair pricing, things like that. And so, yeah, we're working with them and it's great. And I have probably like five to 10 people that I'm like, yes, let's work together. But I always love meeting new people. And so when I can, I'll still do those, but not as often for sure. Yeah. But yeah, that was the the start of it was just figuring it out. And I was promised the LA experience, you know, and that's what it was. So now that you have your, you know, close knit group of people, mm -hmm. how do you deal with the money side of that in terms of like paying for services versus sharing ownership on stuff? Yep. I have found in the last two years that the least stressful and the best for my relationships or like the best way to talk about money that saves relationships is to not be involved in the, the discussion and let my manager take care of that and do sure. that side of it. I just pay the invoices. He sends it to me. I do the wire transfer. That's how it like ends, you know? And so I'm not bartering. I'm not doing things like that. He's the one going to bat in the email threads. And it's usually, it's funny because like another weird part about music is, especially with money, is that the two parties who are exchanging money are never talking to each other. It's always their representatives that are talking to each other. And so it's just weird. And there can be weird tension between your representatives that transfers to you, even though you're BFFs with this person or whatever, you know, like right. you're just hanging out. But then it's like, oh, there's weird beef between our managers because <laughs> they wanted more money than we wanted to spend. It's funny how that all works, but how often is that happening after the fact? What do you mean? Like the song's been done. Now we're talking money or is it always before you? Oh, it's always after, which is the weirdest part. That, that to me is so strange. Yeah. Why not just do it before? Because you don't know if the song's going to get finished. And that's the weird part is there's no like rate for hanging out. You can't put a price on just hanging out with someone. And so it's like, I'll go to people's houses and it's like, yo, let's hang out, make a song, see what happens. Oh, that song is really cool. Okay, let's finish it. Okay, now that's money. But there's a lot of times where it's you go, okay, let's go hang out. Uh, the song's whatever. Or honestly, I have a million sessions where it's like, we're not feeling it, we're tired. Let's just like go get food or something. You know, like that right. happens all the time too. I'm not going to pay you $750 to get Chick-fil-A together. Yeah, you know, yeah, of like, course. I think that's why it's the way it is. I think it shouldn't be that way. I don't know how to solve it. And it's hard because rates are fluid, you know, yeah. they're not set in stone because a lot of times, maybe on this song, I tracked all the vocals and I comped it myself. I'm doing that a lot more these days. I just like engineering my own vocals because I can do it exactly how I want. Mm -hmm. So maybe that reflects on the rate, you know, because I did a lot of the work or I recorded all the drums or I edited a bunch of stuff or something. It's getting to the point where it's a lot more collaborative as in I'm doing a lot of the work also, instead of just like, I'm the artist, I show up and you produce the whole thing. That's another level of it that's hard. That makes a lot of sense why so, it's confusing. Yeah, and so that's why my manager Brian is going to bat a lot of times for that kind of stuff. He's like, yo, Landon brought a lot of the stuff already done. Your job wasn't as extensive. And you could make arguments for both where it's just like, they still did their thing, so they should get the full rate. But it's just confusing and it's all weird, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, I see how that's not going to be a simple thing to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm filtering this through no, my experience, right? Absolutely. As a, on a recording studio. Yep. And it's like, there's zero of that because I I wouldn't be able to survive. Sure. You know, but now with the, the way the industry works now of like, there's so many home studios where there's just less overhead. Yep. Doesn't mean that they're people's individual talents. I mean, I've heard your music. It's incredible. <laughs> like there's, there's awesome stuff happening. Mm -hmm everywhere. Yep. But it's easier to have flexible rates if you're not paying for a room. Oh, absolutely. Right. So yep. if you don't have a bunch of gear, that's, you know, burning mm -hmm. a hole in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for me, it's just like, this is the rate Yep. and I will do everything. If yep. you want to do something, by yeah. all means, sure, sure. go ahead. Yep. But this is the rate. Yep. No, absolutely. <laughs> you know, we can do that. I've had situations where it's like, I didn't have to do as much on this. So let me make it up on other, like, why don't we throw an acoustic version in? Sure. Or cool. Well, we'll make more content for you or we'll do something, you know, yeah. like we'll go over the top because you provided more. Yeah. The conversation comes up more for me too, where it's like, hey, I think I can do guitars and bass and maybe some of this stuff at home. What's your rate if I do half of it or whatever? And I'm like, we could, or we just 
fine. We'll just have a better starting point. We'll put sure. more time into making it even better. Yep, <laughs> you know, yep. like, but my situation's very different. Sure. And everybody's is. Yeah, so, absolutely. But I get it. But yeah, I think, oh man, I, that would stress me out so much yep. to just be like, well, I did all this. Now let's negotiate the price. Yep. Oh my God. No That's way. why I, I can't do it. have removed myself from the conversation more I would, or less. Man. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, okay, but. A lot of people don't have managers. Yep. They're not in the position that are listening to this podcast going, well, I can't do that. Yep. And a lot of people are just going over to friends' basements and collaborating and hanging out and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then there can be this weird ground. Yep. Ultimately, I think we just have to do our best to be as transparent as possible. Yep. And if you feel like, hey, this is developing into something, just try to have the conversation earlier of like, I want to yep. make sure that you're compensated and you feel like you're getting paid for your time. Yep. And try to do it earlier if you can. Yeah. Because I, I do think it's it's harder. Oh, absolutely. Especially once the song is out. Yeah. Especially if it gets placed on a Spotify playlist. Yep. Like, ah, oh, man, that gets really complicated. So do your best. Yep. Obviously, if you're going into more of a traditional studio like mine or others that are in town, there's usually just a set rate. You're just paying for hours and you're going. So whatever the process is, but try to communicate as upfront as you can. Yeah. I mean, I have a context with that a lot. When I was mentioning Alex earlier, it almost like ruined our friendship in the beginning just because when the song started to do really well, and then when I signed, that was the hard part because it was like, basically, and I wouldn't recommend doing this, but I signed my licenses away for 25 years because I didn't understand what I was signing. So they bought out my catalog, which means that all of a sudden, Alex wasn't getting his 50% because how we were doing it was I was just giving him a 50-50 split on the master and I was paying him for the mixes. Mm -hmm. But as far as production fee and everything, we were just doing it collaboratively and we just split the master. Yep. And so all of a sudden he's not getting his master split anymore and he's just getting a flat payout from the master buyout. And it was just like a, it was a tough conversation. And like you were saying, just have the conversation early. And I think with friends and if you don't have $2,000 lying around to give someone for a production fee, I think the master split thing works really well. And everyone feels like they're getting a piece of the pie when it's like, okay, we are just getting paid based on if this song does something and it makes people put more effort into it when it's like, okay, we need the song to kind of be successful. I don't know. There's a million different schools of thought there, but yes. I think that's a, a decent one for people who don't have the like capital to give someone thousands of dollars. It's like, that's a way that you can show them that you value their input to your music and things. I don't know. That worked for us. Yes. But yeah, it was hard for sure. Yeah. It, I mean, there's essentially two sides, right? There's mm -hmm. let's work on this together and split our earnings, we'll equally try to put in the same amount of investment, time, equity, mm -hmm. whatever. And then there's, I'll pay you up front. Yep. And I own this. Yep. And then there's all the millions of shades of gray in between. Yes, when you're starting, it's really great to just not have to go in the hole because you don't know if any of this is going to do well. Mm -hmm. However, then to some extent, you are tied to that collaborator yep, with absolutely. some decisions in the future. Yep. You just have to think about that. Yep. They might have a, a bigger say in something that you know, particularly if your collaborator is a producer, mm -hmm. right? And you're the artist, you're the one who's going to try to get this thing promoted. Yep. The producer may not do any of that. Oh, absolutely. And so then if they're holding back something that you want to do, yep. that can be frustrating. Sure. And that can be really where you go, I wish I would have just paid for this up front. No, and I had that conversation and that thought the exact same thing. And there's a quote from Steve Albini when he's talking about the um, Nirvana record that he did and they wanted to do something with like master splits or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but he sent them like a handwritten letter or something. And he's like, I'd want you to pay me like a plumber. And that's what he said, <laughs> where it's just like pay him up front and do that thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it does take out the gray area when you do that. And yeah. I think that's, if you can afford to do that, I think that's awesome. It is always more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I look back on that all the time and I'm like, man, I don't know. I probably couldn't have pulled the money together as a college student, but if I would have, I mean, I would have made way more money down the line. But I don't know. Hindsight's twenty twenty. It is. I'm not bringing this up to say there's a right or wrong way. We yep. both know there's not. Yep. You know, I think you just you do what you can with what you've got. Mm -hmm. And then you learn. Exactly. Yep. But I think the, the takeaways from this are to, to make sure that you have a conversation about it, mm -hmm. try to get it in writing. And just understand what it means. I think one of the, the first things I'll say about that is that when royalties are generated, depending on how they're generated, they pay out differently. So there's two copyrights in music. There's one for the master, as you were saying, and then there's one for the publishing side, the songwriting. When a song earns money and generates royalties, it's not always for both. 
Some things only generate money for the master and some things only generate money for publishing. I don't know if everybody understands that exactly. I mean, it, it I took did, me a while yeah, to, uh, same. to see I that. still barely do. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, it's one thing if you say, yeah, we're going to split the master, but then you need to understand, well, wait, where does the master make money? Yep. And wait, where does it, where would only the songwriter make money? So yep. that if things change or depending on how you structure your deal, you actually know when you're going to get paid and when you're not going to get paid. Yep, absolutely. And it's confusing. It's more confusing than it ought to be. I wholeheartedly believe that. I do have a royalties guide for people where it, it breaks down. There's like a chart and stuff. I'll put that in the show yeah, notes that's too. Sick, so actually. if you get to this part in the conversation, you can look at that and start to go, oh, those come from the master. Those come from the song. Just so that if you are entering into an agreement like that, you can understand what you're talking about to sure. some extent. And in that guide, it, it shows people how to like register stuff and things like that too. Let's take a quick break so I can tell you about my latest offering for independent artists here at Helvig Productions. As you may know, I'm a music producer located here in the Twin Cities, and I've been running a recording studio for the last 15 years. I've worked with hundreds of local artists spanning pop, rock, Americana, and all the various forms of indie singer-songwriter music. And I know just how hard it can be to finish your own songs. It's easy to get stuck in a death loop of endlessly tweaking things, rewriting sections, or just completely starting over and never feeling satisfied. This is why I've started offering a free song analysis, which I call Musician's Roadblock Relief. If you're currently stuck working on that same song over and over again, I'd love to offer you some ideas that may help. I will objectively analyze your track and offer some helpful possibilities to hopefully get you unstuck and back to finishing that project. My feedback will cover one of the three areas where I've seen artists struggle the most. The first one is the song itself. I've had artists come to me wanting to produce a song that just isn't great. But there's no sense in spending money on a bad song because no amount of production or mixing will fix that. You need strong melodies, good lyrics, and a nice flow from start to finish. The second roadblock I see artists run into is bad production. Even if the song is good, the production needs to match the sound you want. Are the sounds right for your style? Is the arrangement too messy? How does it build? Are you doing too much or too little? When all the supporting production elements work in harmony, the song comes to life. And the last thing is mixing problems. Nothing is more frustrating than loving your song, but discovering it sounds terrible everywhere outside of your home studio. Pro-level mixing is hard, and it takes years to master. Mixing problems may be holding you back. If you've wasted enough time in the trial and error loop and are ready to try a different approach, head to helvigproductions.com slash fixmysong and fill out my application. That's H-E-L-V-I-G productions.com slash fixmysong. I'll take a look at your specific situation, and if I think I can help, I certainly will. It's 100% free and may just be the thing to get you unstuck and back making progress toward your goals. Let's hop over to, we've, we've covered, I think, the collaboration process pretty fairly well here. Let's hop over to some, like, some of the business entrepreneurial stuff. Sure. I'm curious, first and foremost, because this is such a big part of our lives, and I think it's something everybody struggles with, is how you look at social media. Mm -hmm. First... I can already pretty much assume, because everybody says this, that they hate it. Yep. <laughs> we all mutually hate it for the most. There's got to be some people out there that like it, but most of us don't. Yep. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. I've followed you online, you know, for a number of years now, and I think you do a really nice job. I think that you have a a really nice balance of like, I'd say it's it's humor first. Sure. Um, yep. Which is great. I always appreciate that, but with a decent dose of vulnerability mixed in there too. Like you keep it real a lot of times in terms of what you're going through, what you're thinking about, what you're struggling with, what you're asking for, why this feels weird, a lot of things. And it feels authentic. It feels like you, you know, like this is the first time we're hanging out, but you know, with that kind of content, you know, it feels sure. like I kind of do know you cool. a little bit yeah, for that right. reason, which I think is the goal, right? Absolutely. Yeah. But okay. So let me, I'll actually get to a question at this sure. point, which yep. is where did it start? And how were you thinking about it then? How do you think about it now, mm -hmm. now that you have, you know, a growing fan base and sure. more pressure and that kind sure. of stuff? Has it changed? Yeah. Like I was mentioned before, I got that laptop and I was recording drum covers and I posted them on Facebook. Don't know why I did that. I guess that's where my internet videos started way back in the day. But in college, it transitioned to I would post covers on my Instagram and people liked that and they're like, you should sing more. And I was like, okay, cool. Transitioning to putting out music. I put out music during um, the pandemic, so the only place that my music existed was online. 
there was no real anything surrounding it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like my career has always existed in the internet. And it's so funny when people always talk about like, man, what's it like to have a viral song, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I've never really experienced any virality on like Instagram or TikTok or anything like that. So it's always felt like this huge disconnect between my social media and my Spotify, mm. where it's like people look at my Spotify and they're like, oh, you must be a huge artist. And I'm like, well, it's just kind of like algorithms on Spotify that are going crazy. Like if you look at my like active listeners, it's like 200,000 people or like 100,000 people even. It's less than 20% or something like sure. that. And it's mostly algorithmic, you know? So it's like people are just hearing the song. So it's like they listen to their the coin album. And then after that, when the coin album is done, it plays 2 a.m., you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what people are listening to. And they're usually not clicking on my artist page and going to my Instagram. They may not be saving it. They may yeah. not be registering. They may not even look Conrath. at who it is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's playing in a coffee shop somewhere, yeah. you know? And so it is funny when people think that I have a huge social media following and like, after five years of posting online, I just cracked 10,000 followers, you know, and that's like considered small yeah, in this it world is, yeah. of I mean, it's still social a social media. Deal. Yeah. Oh, it was it was massive. And I was like, wow, that's insane. And it was weird. But I think how I try to look at social media now and I thought it was funny how you're saying there probably are people out there who like it. And I know there's at least one because this guy changed how I think about social media. Um, Ian Allison. Yeah. I'm sure you're familiar. Yes. Um, he was someone who I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with when I was starting my music career. Um, we played at church together a lot. Okay. Um, we we're playing every single week, sometimes twice a week together um, on Wednesdays and Sundays. And so I got to a lot of FaceTime with Ian and I got to talk to him a lot. And his outlook on social media almost bothered me. It annoyed me because of how positive he was about it. He's also just like positive in general. And it like pissed me off sometimes because I was like, I'm struggling with a bunch of stuff and it seems like you never are. What's the deal with that? Yeah. And I was like, you actually like Instagram? He's like, yeah, I enjoy the connection. I enjoy the process of making videos. I enjoy talking about bass. You know, like he just likes that. And something that I gleaned from that was what I was talking about earlier with my jazz instructor is how do you make the process enjoyable mm. and how do you enjoy the work of it? And so my thing that I've tried to do lately is just do things that I think are funny, like make skits that are fun. And I enjoy like going on a walk in the morning and brainstorming a stupid video. And then I'll get home and I'll write down the script and I'll shoot the video and then I'll edit it. And in 45 minutes, it's done. But social media is still, it's super hard for me and it's super hard to be consistent and it's super hard to like gauge my expectations because at the end of the day, of course I want to go viral. You know, I can say that I want to be underground and cool and whatever as much as I want. But of course, I want people to come to my shows. I want to sell out things. And it's super hard to sit there and watch your peers have video after video go crazy. And you're wondering what you're doing wrong, you know, because the most like painful part, I think, about the age of social media that musicians are in is that you're always one video away from being successful. Or at least that's what I think it's the feeling that's the feeling, you know, yeah. like you're one reel away, you're one TikTok away. This one could be the one that flips your career. This song could be the one, you know, and when you think of it that way, it's terrible. It's super exhausting because you put the weight of the world on everything that you're posting. And I've tried as much as I can to get myself away from that and to focus more on just building a community. Yeah. Something that I've started this year or last year maybe was Discord. Oh, and okay. I've really enjoyed that. Because it's such a direct community. I can just message people who are directly excited about it because they've gone the extra mile to join this like secondary social media. You know, like they've gone down the rabbit hole. So I know they're excited about it. Whereas Instagram, it's like I have 11,000 followers, but 20 people comment on a video. You know, it's like the engagement is so low on Instagram. Like, I mean, this morning I was looking at this guy, really famous Instagram musician. He has almost a million followers. And I was looking at his videos and it's like most of them average like a thousand likes. And it's just like the engagement is so abysmal on Instagram that it's hard to like find a community there. So I've enjoyed that secondary discord where it's just yeah. like the people are stoked. And I've always tried to just community first is always my idea. And like when I'm at shows, I want to meet the people. I want to go to the merch booth and like shake as many hands as I can and stuff. And yeah, I've tried to look at Instagram more as a means to just connection with people instead of a means of 
pushing my songs to the world. And I think that's helped a bit. But yeah, just trying to find ways to enjoy making videos again. Yeah. It's hard. I think it's a mindset shift, right? Yeah. And Ian being the example of like, he's got the right mindset. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm mm-hmm. going to find how to enjoy this. He really And does. it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to be able to do it. But when it comes to social media, we all understand that we're trying to build something with it. We're mm-hmm. trying to build a community. We're trying to grow a fan base. We're trying to connect more with people. Mm-hmm. You know, all these things are overlapping, but it can feel, it can feel tough because just the act of promoting can feel like trying to trick somebody into oh, liking absolutely. what you do, you know? Mm-hmm. It sucks. But I, I honestly believe that it's, it's really not. I mean, you're just trying to find people that are going to care about your artistry, mm-hmm. that want to like it. And it's really has nothing to do with tricking people into anything. Like nobody gets tricked into anything. Like that yep. never, doesn't happen. Sure. You're just putting yourself out there. And then people that are like, that resonates with me are going to follow along. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, on these episodes of the podcast, we're always talking about business, talking about process. We're talking about the struggles. So this comes up all the time. And It's been interesting, the amount of people that will shy away from really even talking about like, this is what I do to promote something. Sure. And I think it's partially because just we don't want to be associated with like pushing something. Sure. You know, like, as you said, like, I want to be underground and it's like, it's cool. No, absolutely. No, exactly. It's like, you know, the music business is ultimately a popularity contest to some extent, to a large extent. And it's the coolest thing is to be cool without trying to be cool. That's the goal. That's the holy grail. I didn't do anything, man. Everybody just loves me. Yep. But I just think that's such bullshit. Yeah, absolutely. Ultimately, it's just bullshit because really it's just about making it look like either, either it's just blind luck, complete blind luck that you have no control over and will go away at some point because you have no control over it. It will disappear. Or you're just hiding what you're doing yep. for the sake of making it look cooler. Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah. Let's, we, can, we can do better than that. We can just all understand that we're all in this doing the same thing together. It's not about anything more than trying to find our audience. You're trying to find the people that love what you do. I'm trying to find the people that love what I do and so on and so forth. And that's great because at the end of the day, that's good for us and it should be good for them. Like, let's not forget that. It should be, you know? When I find your latest song, I'm like, sweet. Thank you for putting that out because now I can add it to my playlist, you know? Like, that's what I'm thinking. Yep. And I I don't see how else you would interpret it of like, yeah. why is he showing me his No, music? exactly. Like, like it's, annoyed so, it's by just it. a little thumb, thumb flick. If I don't like it, it goes away. It's not a big deal. But yet we can't seem to really get that out of our heads somehow of like, that it's just bad to be doing that. And I just think, We have to keep talking about it because it's not. And when you see people do it well, Ian being a great example, for anybody that doesn't know Ian Allison, go follow him online. You watch his content and you realize that like, yeah, this is what it could be. It's simple. It's genuine. It's educational and funny. He strikes the balance of all of that stuff. And what it never is, is feeling like pushy or coming off. But it's a lot easier to look at somebody else's thing than to look at your own. Absolutely. Yep. And it's also like, I think something that people say a lot is it's like only stupid until it works or whatever. And people feel, people feel weird about like putting high quality videos on the internet or like trying to be like an influencer when the follower account isn't there. Like it's one thing to post like a video like that when you have a hundred thousand followers or if you have 200, you know, it like people feel stupid about doing it. But it's like only stupid until it works, I feel like, you know, and then it's yeah. like everyone's like, oh, how'd you do that? So I don't know. There, There is such a disconnect with it where it's like, yeah, you you feel like dumb for doing it, but everyone's trying to do the same thing. Like, it's fine. You know, I don't know. I agree. Everyone is trying to do this. It's okay to try. I think that's the main thing. It's like, it's okay to try and to look like you're trying. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. If people judge you for that, they're not your people. You know, that's really what it comes down to. I don't know if it's, if it's a thing, like if, you know, if people get hung up on that, like, because somebody, you know, pointed them out or whatever, (laughs) I don't know, maybe that happens. I think a lot of it's just in our heads. Yeah. It's just the fear. For sure. That something might come off the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
I mean, Me I don't, I certainly don't have the answers to it. I'm no social media expert at all, but I do know a bit about community building. And let's circle back to that because social media is a part of that. I think in order to build a community, you need a couple things. Mm -hmm. You need consistency. You need to connect with people. And then you're going to need to be competent at something. So first thing, consistency, you got to show up. You got to show up often enough so that you're not being drowned out by everybody else that's going to show up often enough. So that's part of it. And the beauty of sticking with it and posting a lot is that you get better at it. It goes Absolutely. a little faster. It gets a little easier. So that's the, that's the win of showing up more often than not and not being too harsh about everything you post. Just let stuff go. Just get it out there. And then in terms of the connections, I think you need to use social media to your advantage to meet people, you know, to reach out to people that you want to be like and ask them questions, whether it's like being, you know, connected with Ian, although that did happen in real life. But I'm sure that there's a lot of people that you've met solely through oh, yeah. Instagram that Absolutely. are a big part of your career now and that you've learned from and things like that. So, you know, don't be afraid to connect with people. Yeah. Use it for that reason. I use it all the time. I met you this way now, you know? And then being competent in something, looking at what your strengths and weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. If you're good at making the content, or let's say you're maybe you're good at, at the ideas of stuff, but less good at making content, maybe you need help with that. Or even just whatever it is that you're promoting. So music-wise, hey, I'm a great songwriter and producer, not the best at mixing. I need to find somebody to do that, you know, so that whatever you're putting out there gets stronger and stronger. Absolutely. Yeah. But at the same time, as we kind of talked about this earlier, you're not going to be perfect right away. Yeah, no. You're, you got to just let it go. Like, put stuff out and move on. You, you know, before this interview started, you said the curse of Minneapolis was like, there's so many people that have great music that they just don't even let out. Yeah. And there is that of like, there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves and social media is a part of that. What was it like when you put out your first song and follow-up question to that what do you think would have happened if it didn't do as well as it did yeah i mean i was um lucky enough to put out my first song like right before pandemic like this is january 29th 2020 is when it came out so like six weeks before the world shut down i think so yeah january 29th i was still in college and i put out the song and i remember walking around like the common area of the school and seeing a bunch of people listening to it and like people coming up to me and saying that they just checked it out or something and it was a very like surreal experience of like it existed here all of a sudden like it there was a community already around it kind of <laughs> and it was like i think that was what jump started it in a way was it just had like a a really centralized area that people were latching onto it and man, I guess I've never really thought about what would have happened if it didn't do well, but I seriously think that I wouldn't really have produced or sorry, I wouldn't have pursued songwriting as hard as I did. And that's like a weird thing to think about because I don't know what else I'd be doing with my life. But like you were saying before we started talking, how you'd be doing it anyways, there was a thing that my old drum teacher, Steve Gould mentioned a few years back. And he was saying like, he's talking about like music as a job and how he feels like he's kind of almost cheating because this is what he would do in his free time anyways, you know? And it's like, I think it's the same for me. I think if I really stepped back and looked at my life and was like, if I hadn't been successful in my pursuits of music, like, would I still be doing this? And I think, yes, but maybe not to the same extent. And it's like, I mean, I was so fortunate to be able to put everything into it because I released music and all of a sudden the world's shut down and like I was able to just sit at home for six months straight and just make music. You know, I had this like, it was literally a perfect storm of it all. So I feel super fortunate, obviously, for that. And I truly don't know if I would have pursued it as hard. But yeah, I think that's something I try to explain to people when they're asking about like how to put music out now in this climate where it's like you feel like you need to build an online following before you release anything. I think it's more important to build like a physical following of like your close circle, like get people excited about what you're doing initially in your like just friend group. And don't worry about like trying to get a TikTok to go insane. I don't know. Maybe that's bad advice because that's actually maybe what you should be doing. I don't know. But in my experience, it was when I put out that first song, it was very on the ground. It was just the people around me that were listening to it. 
And it was really cool to like have that immediate community that way. I don't know. I don't think it's bad advice. Yeah. I mean, like a lot of things in life, both things can be true. As we see more and more stuff get released all the time and more and more people get really great at doing stuff on their own and just, you know, like to some extent, I, I feel like, and this is a little bit of just my prediction of what, you know, five years from now is going to look like, but I think that we're going to care more about what's happening in our communities because the amount of choices will be so large yeah, and so vast that don't get me wrong, you know, things that sit on editorial playlists and like these high curated gatekeeper kind of things, like whether it's Spotify or something different in the future, like they're still going to be super popular. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, in terms of trying to figure out like, well, what do I want to listen to? I do think that it might start becoming more localized again, yeah. just because there's too much to care about. There's too yeah. much to care about. And th that just is one way to narrow things down. Yep. So I think getting people that are in your network, in your community, immediate community excited is a good place to start. It's also grounding. You know, just looking at stuff online is disorienting to say the least. Absolutely. You alluded to this earlier and that your Spotify has, you know, 500, 600,000 monthly listeners or whatever. And then it's like, whoa. But then at the same time, it's like, but how many people are going to be at the show? Or how many people are going to actually comment on this thing that I do? Or exactly. Stream, you know, it's smaller. It You can't ignore those numbers and they do mean something. They are important numbers. You can't discount them. I mean, that's how a lot of us look at stuff and go like, that's legit. Whether or not that's a good way of doing it, it's what we do now. It's what we do as a, as a society, but it can be confusing, especially then, you know, and I'm sure this has happened to you to some extent, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, your first couple songs go gangbusters. So now that's your baseline of yeah, like absolutely. success. Yep. You know, like it's impossible to keep that up. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've experienced that where it's like, I haven't had a new release crack my top five on Spotify since I put out those songs. You know? Oh, totally. So a, sucks. a band that I worked with, the very first song they released mm -hmm. got on a playlist, you know, mm -hmm. starts getting millions of plays or whatever. Everything they released since doesn't. Everything they've, re they've released since is better. It's all better. But does it feel that way always? Yep. You know, not always. That, no. it, that can really mess with your mind. I think that's a huge problem with Spotify and how they lay out the artist page is your most played song is always going to be at the top. And so when someone clicks into you, that's always the first song they're going to play. And it's like hard to find people's albums too. You have to like go to like the separate thing, scroll down past all the singles and then there's the album. I know. You know, it's like, why are they not just putting the new stuff up top? I don't know. But yeah, it's like 2AM has 20 whatever million streams and that's never going to leave the top spot, it feels like, you know, unless something insane happens. And it's like hard to remove yourself from that where it's like the, mu the new music still matters and people are listening to it, but it's just like hard when it feels like you're never going to be as good as you were that one time. You know, it's just like, oh, that sucks. Right. It's hard to get ourselves and our world around us to stop listening to the first song on Spotify. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. but it's convenient. If you go to a new artist, you're not going to go dig through their catalog to listen to a random one. You're going to listen to the first one. Yeah. I don't know how to change that, but yep. it just is what it is. All right. I have a few more questions. I don't want to keep you too long. I know no, that good. this has already been a long conversation, but oh, it's, no just, worries. it's been great. This is another multi-part question. I have a tendency to do that, like ask three questions at once. Yep. But they're all related to some extent. We talked earlier about, you know, it's been a short amount of time and you've come a very long way. You know, I checked out your Fine Line show last, this last spring. Like the band is awesome. That tour looked like it was really successful. You're about to head on another one. You've got an album coming out. You said 40-ish songs or whatever, like yep. high output, touring a lot. You're posting a lot online, you know, all these collaborations you've done, you know, there's so much, man. Yeah. You're, you're at, at a sprint yep. pretty much all out for a few years here. Yep. How do you deal with burnout? I think I'm getting better at it, but not well. I mean, the 2022 to 2023 were like two of the worst years of my life. And I had never like really been legitimately depressed in my life before, but that was the furthest down the hill I'd ever gone. And it was the darkest time in my life. I uh, was like suicidal. It was terrible. Oh, there was so much things that were happening. 
And I mean, we don't need to talk about that on Instagram, I guess, but it was a dark time of my life and it was hard to get out of that. And I don't really know exactly what I did to pull myself out of that. But I think something that has helped me a lot is just trying to find habits and rhythms in the chaos of music because you're going to get no rhythm and you're going to get no habits from the music industry because everything's so chaotic and it's so different. You need to find something outside of your work that grounds you. Mm. So I, I recently got married. That's been something that's been really grounding for me. Just having a relationship with someone who's not involved with music is awesome because we don't talk about music when we talk. You know, we can have dinner and we can just talk about life. Yeah. And we can just hang out. And that's super nice. And every morning I try and like go on a walk or do something weird like that or just like make, I make coffee or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it was trying to find things outside of my work that gave me life because you can't find stability in the music industry. Maybe in a nine to five, you could find some stability, like there's a rhythm there, but there's no rhythm really in this lifestyle because you're touring, you're traveling, there's ups and downs. Some days are really awesome. Some days suck. Like one of your reels gets a bazillion views and that's cool. And that hits a dopamine, whatever. And then you get no interaction on a video and now you're sad all of a sudden. And so it's like trying to remove yourself from that was key for me, I guess. But I don't really know what the actual action steps for that were. But now I don't even remember what the original question was. Oh, but burnout. Yeah, burnout. Okay. Yep. I think collaboration is also been a huge part for me. Mm. I had a huge chip on my shoulder after my first record, my first studio album, like Nothing Matters Anyways, was my first full length. And I had a huge chip on my shoulder that I didn't do it by myself. And I wanted to prove to people that I could make music by myself too, for whatever reason, because I had this huge idea that I was only where I was at because of this person. Yeah. Or because of whatever, you know? And it's like I couldn't get it through my head that I was doing anything right. It felt like a product of everyone else. And I drove myself insane and I made two EPs all by myself, basically. And it was fun and it was good to do that by myself, but it sucked. And so I've recently started doing things with people again, which has brought a lot of life back to it. So that's been good. But yeah, burnout's terrible. And I think just trying to find ways that you can incorporate, like I was saying, like habits and rhythms into your life and try not to just chase only the high feelings and things like that, but yeah. trying to just like have a more s stable life. Do you have habits, routines or anything that you use personally between like balancing? This is when I work on the creative stuff. This is when I work on the business stuff. I don't and I should, but I've tried to start working on music a lot more in the morning slightly. And that's been really nice. I used to be more of a night owl thing. And that's how I made a lot of the early music was like late sessions and things like that. But I've been trying to just like wake up do my thing, make breakfast, and then like immediately just like start doing things right away. And I think doing it in the morning has been helpful for me at least. Yeah, I don't know. I honestly am like preaching that you should have rhythms, but I'm also like not really doing it a ton in my own life. Like my life is so sporadic and I think I'm really excited for an opportunity after this record comes out and after this tour is done. I'd love to just kind of go ghost mode a little bit and sign off for a bit and not put out a million songs. I'm going to be done with my label after this uh, after this record comes out. And I don't know what the future holds yet. I'd probably love to just do some sort of distribution deal and not sign with the label. But I'm excited to just take some time away from that and figure out my life again, kind of, and like what it could be. And yeah, I don't know. I'm excited for that opportunity for sure. Yeah. Slow down a little. I think one of the things that and I say this and I, I don't do it, but yep, <laughs> uh, yep. But I think that's part of building in these routines is building in some space for reflection. Yeah. And, that, and I think that you see this a lot amongst creatives of like, there's like, wow, they're doing a lot and then they disappear. You know, part of that's burnout. Part of it's like that moment of like, I got to reassess. Yeah. I mean, I've even been talking among people of like this podcast has been doing, you know, an episode every week. It's yep. been an insane amount of extra work on top of already a busy schedule. And I'm like, yeah, I might, you know, stop at some point and then just kind of decide what I want to do next. And sure. like, yeah, looking forward to like, wouldn't it be nice if I just didn't for a while? Yeah. But then there's that fear of like, yeah, then you just disappear off the map and like, it's tough. And I wonder if, you know, 
we all could work a little bit better at finding either a more sustainable pace to begin with, or just the habits and routines that can be maintained when you have lots of energy for them and when you don't. Yep. But there's things that you can still do. Oh, for sure. I'm not sure. I think it's probably different for everybody. Sure. But, you know, this kind of reminds me a few episodes ago, we had Siri Unlin from Humbird on. And I don't know if you know if it was like in the conversations we had before the podcast or on the podcast, but at some point, I remember her saying that like, you know, this is the music business. Like no one's going to pat you on the back and be like, you're doing a good job. And I think that that's, that's tough. Like you don't realize how useful it probably is in a typical nine to five to have a job, to have a, a boss or a manager, or whoever say like, cool, you're meeting expectations. Like it's one thing to be like, you're doing great. And, you know, but even just like, yeah, this is what's expected of you. You're doing fine. There's no benchmarks. You never get a benchmark. And so you, you're playing with your own mind's benchmarks, which are sometimes quite unfair. Yep. And that's tough. But I don't, you know, outside of trying to do it for each other, you know, I can say, Landon, like I'm super impressed. How far you've come in four or five years is insane. The output, the quality of music, all of it's great. Like you're crushing it. And that might help for a little bit. Sure. But then it's back to... <laughs> No, However absolutely. you feel about it, you know? Yep. And whoever you're comparing yourself to, mm -hmm. there's never going to be somebody that can just put it at ease. No, I know. It's weird because it's like every day there's, there is like a goal of like what I'm trying to do, but there's never like a, I accomplished everything I needed to accomplish in this given time period. Like my wife works in insurance and at the end of the day, she finishes the amount of cases she need to close out and that's it. And she's done for the day, mm -hmm. you know? 4.45 p.m., mind off, don't have to think about work until tomorrow. In music, obviously, there's no set schedule for anything, really. There's no, like, goal that needs to happen every day. And there's no, like you're saying, benchmark. So it's like, it's this weird thing where it's like you're kind of never done. And that is weird when you never stop thinking about work. And it's just really, yeah, that's hard. But I don't know. Trying to find ways to, like, put tangible goals in front of me myself to, like, I don't know what they look like necessarily, but I can offer some insight into this a l just a little bit. I do think it comes down to what we've been saying, like wanting to set routines and habits and then having some something that you can measure for yourself. I think it's best to measure actions like output actions, not necessarily results. I think you can have goals of like, I want to get to 10,000 followers by the end of the year or something like that. But I sometimes that's hard to control, right? Oh, absolutely. I think it's better to measure the things that lead up to that of like, I want to post this many times a week or whatever, and then just work on the systems to do that. Sure. Because I'll use the podcast again as, as an example. I have a benchmark of like, I want to put out an episode every week for a year, and then I'll decide if I'm going to keep doing it. But for a year, I'm going to do it without question. That gives me a sense of accomplishment. Now, sometimes I feel like crushed that episode, nailed it. And sometimes I'm like, Nah, could yep. have done better. Yep. I didn't put much thought in. I didn't. I wasn't prepared enough for that one. Sure. Or maybe I should have edited it differently or, or done clips, you know, a million different things. But I did it. But I got it out. And at the end of that week, I can be like, okay, I accomplished that. And I don't spend as much time looking at like, how well did it do? You know, those kind of measurements, nah. Yeah, they're dangerous. They're dangerous. It's just, I did it. I did it and it'll do what it's going to do now. Yeah, And then I can think back of like, how do I want to do the next one? Sure. Is there a way I think I could make it better where I would be happier about it? Whether that means making it easier or making the content what I feel would be better content. So I think you can do those kind of things and those lead to more, you know, hopefully better habits, but it also can be like a mission accomplished. No, absolutely. I did the thing, you know, and sometimes that's like, I want to get an album out this record or this year, you know, and then. Try not to look so much at the results of it and just more at your own process. Yeah. And then the second thing I would add to that is it's just really, really helpful to have hours. Give yourself hours. I did not. Sure. For like a decade. And, you know, I'm, I'm in my late thirties at this point. So like, I've been doing this a while and it's like, yeah, that's really important. I can say that at some point, like you do want to just give yourself some hours, some office hours where you're like, cause like you said, your wife. At the end of the day, got these cases closed, done. And then I assume that she's not then checking TikTok and Instagram to see like how her content's doing. No, exactly. That's not a part of yeah, her yeah, job, yeah. but for yep. creatives, it is. 
And so even when you're, you're okay, I'm done with the studio or I'm done working on something. Yeah, but there's your phone that you're always yep, on. Still doing and stuff, you can still yeah. check on, see how things are performing. Yep. And that's dangerous because you never turn that off. So giving yourself some office hours sure, to yeah, just be like, I'm out. Yeah, I don't absolutely. check things after seven o'clock. I don't respond to stuff. I don't, you know, not that you're going to be perfect at it every day, oh, but yeah. even if you are 50% good at it, you will be happy about that. Sure. So if you feel yourself dealing with burnout, these are some things that I think can help where it's like, well, I can't just quit. I need to keep going. Start focusing on your processes and just think of, did I do the process? Don't worry about the results. Make sure the processes are accomplishable, that it's a reasonable rate. And then office hours. Yeah, Check out. I think that's smart. Yeah. Check out. It's okay. The rest of the world does it. And those those massive 500 fortune companies, yep, they still they're work. They're still going. Yep. Your career will be just fine. Like the world will be okay if you're not there 24-7. It's hard to remember. But, but yeah, yeah, easier said than done. But I, you know, that's what the hope is of these kind of conversations that we're, we're hearing them from more people. And then we're talking amongst each other and saying like, it's okay to do that. Absolutely. It's okay to do that. The world won't end. All right, man. I I feel like I've kept you here long enough. I really appreciate all of this. Is there anything that we missed that you feel like you want to throw in quick? Any point that you want to circle back to or anything that? I don't think so, really. I feel like covered a lot of good stuff. I feel like that too. And I'll end it with this. At the end of every episode, I ask people to share a secret from the scene and it can mean kind of a number of different things, but ultimately I want it to be something that you think will help the listeners out there. So what's the secret that you'd like to share that you've learned in our scene oh, in the last four or five years? Yeah. Wow. I'm trying to think what that would be. Uh, when people ask me about like how I fell into my sound or things like that, or like my production sound, I always tell people to just like double down on like what's available to you, I think is something that can set you apart from other people. For like, for instance, I was a drummer, so the drums were really important in my earlier music. And that's something that people circle back to all the time is like my music is often characterized by fast drum beats or just like the drums are a point of conversation. And I didn't play guitar very well. And so the parts were simple, but they were like effective and they were often super rhythmic. And it was just what I had. And I didn't have an electric guitar when I wrote acetone. I just had an acoustic. So like that was just in the demo, you know, it was like all acoustic driven and drums. And I think instead of trying to match someone else's work, like just double down on what's available to you and double down on what you know how to do and then try and add in from collaboration the other sides of it that you can't replicate. And I think that will produce something that's more unique than if you were like, I want to make a band Camino record. A million people are making band Camino records, you know, and they're awesome, but no one needs another one. So it's like, I don't know, try and double down on what makes you you, I guess. But, you know, limitations can be where the best creativity comes from. Absolutely. In fact, from a production standpoint, and maybe you know this at this point, I don't know what your plugin library looks like, but her sample library looks like. Oh, large. Yeah, yeah. But the larger it gets, the more difficult it can be to actually figure out which sound to use. And I've found that the more I can limit my soundscape or my, the tools that I'm using, sometimes the happier I am with the outcome of just like, well, I'm this is the sound that I have and I'm just going to throw things on it until it works. And sometimes then I can be pleasantly shocked of like, Oh, I I ran that through a bunch of stuff and I don't know what that is. I would have never thought about that. I just was crazy looking for something. And it was that limitation that you put on your process that can yield to something that's a little bit more outside the box. Yep. Sometimes the limitations can theoretically feel like, well, then I can't do what I want, but in practice, a lot of times that's not the case. Yep. I think one more thing that I was just thinking about another secret from the scene, whatever you want to call it, try and focus on growing, surround yourself with your peers rather than trying to break through the ceiling to the next level. I, that was something I took lessons from Zach Miller, who's an amazing drummer in town. Also, that was something that he talked about a lot was how he had this idea of like, man, I want to sit in with the greats of the generation above me instead of focusing on building with my peers, because one day you're going to be those guys mm, yeah. that, you know, 20 years later, people are trying to be. And I think there's so much value in just linking up with the people who are directly around you and focusing on building together instead of trying to jump to the next rung of the ladder early. 
like when I was mentioning pe- getting people excited about your music, it's like, yeah, just try and like build directly with the people you're already in community with and try and make it exciting there. And then it can go from there. But if you don't have a solid starting point, you're not going to have, I don't know what you're not going to have, but it's just like having that solid starting point is great. And trying to link arms with the people directly around you, I think was valuable for my career. Like my band is still the people that I played with years ago. You know, like we met when we were younger and we've just gone up to the ranks together you know and it was never like i jumped up earlier and you know but it also totally makes sense i mean you you're also collaborating with other really successful artists in the city too you mm-hmm. know and you're playing shows together and i think mm-hmm. yeah that sentiment of whether you're you know these people in your community are in your band or you're just playing shows with their band mm-hmm. doing collaborations with them supporting each other on social media whatever it might look going on tour together a, you can learn from each other. Maybe you get somebody to pat you on the back once in a while of like, hey man, you're crushing it, which really does help. It does help. And then, you know, sharing audiences, right? You know, like I know that you, you've played shows with Bear and, and other local artists that have gigantic audiences on their own, right? You know, and all of that helps. And the, the music is, you know, similar enough in terms of style and what people are going to like so you can share audiences and grow together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. We yeah, of course. It. If people want to check you out, where do you like to send people? Instagram, Spotify, wherever you list the music. Anywhere, really. I'd be happy to connect with you. I'd love to see you at a show, though. That'd be the best place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tour coming up this fall. Go check yep. out some dates. And when's the full record drop? Yeah, October 18th. Okay. Yep. And it's called Employee of the Year, and it'll be out. I look forward to it. The singles that are out already are great. I haven't heard anything bad. So keep it up, man. Just yeah, keep it up. Take care I'll of yourself. Try. Yeah. Good luck on the tour. Good luck with the next release. And thanks again for doing this. For everybody that listened, thank you so much for sticking around. I hope that you got as much as I did out of this conversation. I loved all of it. If this was helpful to you, then please consider leaving a rating, you know, following, subscribing, doing all that kind of stuff. It helps the podcast keep going. But more than anything, share it with somebody else that you think might gain something from this and continue the conversation amongst the people that you're involved with. Continue building your own community and connecting with more people. It makes the whole scene better. So thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.